It is April 16th, 2024, and all eyes continue to be on the Middle East right now, as Israel's defense minister has reportedly told his U.S. counterpart that Israel must respond after Iran retaliated for the Israeli bombing on an Iranian consulate building in Syria that killed multiple generals and officers. But does Israel actually have to respond? Wouldn't that just continue to increase tensions? And would the West, that being the U.S., the U.K., and France, would they all step in to protect Israel this time around like they did before? Well, it's assumed that they would. But would other countries in the region, would say Jordan still step in to protect Israel? Would Saudi Arabia and the UAE still provide cover on their end if we continue to see an escalation in tensions? Iran has made it clear exactly what it is capable of of hitting in the region. And Israel seems to be in a position of, on one hand, trying to downplay Iran's retaliation, claiming that it wasn't significant, while on the other hand, claiming that it was significant enough for them to respond to in order to continue increasing these ongoing tensions. We discussed all of that and more earlier with a special guest. So let's take a listen to that conversation now. Joining me now to discuss is Sharmeen Narwani, a journalist and editor-in-chief of The Cradle. Sharmeen, thanks so much for taking the time to join me again. Thank you, Rachel. It's really good to be back. Now, I want to talk to you about the latest here because Israel's defense minister has reportedly told the U.S. that Israel has no choice but to respond to Iran's missile and drone attack, which, of course, was retaliation for Israel's bombing of an Iranian consulate building in Syria. What do you make of the current state of tensions, the fact that there's even talk of an Israeli response after Iran has been very clear that they retaliated and they have concluded their retaliation? Uh, and several points. Uh, just one I should mention because we just had an exclusive today at the cradle um, from a uh, Iranian military security official uh, who said that they have been approached by, uh, via intermediaries by the United States asking um, Iran to allow a face saving strike by the Israelis um, on, uh, on Iran. And um, the, the, the request was, of course, outright rejected, um, says our source. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the message was delivered directly to the Swiss envoy in Tehran by officials from the IRGC and not the foreign ministry. So uh, that's also, you know, it shows that the IRGC is now, the military establishment in Iran is taking more of a lead on things. Um, other than the foreign ministry, which would be a normal situation. But I suppose that's like in U.S. wars as well. You know, the Pentagon steps up front and center um, compared to the State Department. Uh, but but they yeah, they 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 tried to get a face saving uh, strike for Israel out of the Iranians and the Iranians said no. So it's true. The Iranians said they completed their operation. That announcement, by the way, kind of was shocking because who says that? OK, here we go. Missile and drone salvo, the likes of which we've not seen before in this theater. And then, okay, we're done, right? Before the missiles and, and drones had hit their bank of targets, you know, so then everyone just had to stay up in Beirut to like 6.30 a.m. to look for the money shots and like what had been hit and what had blown up. Um, and in, or if in fact, uh, missiles had been intercepted. Um, the Israelis want to retaliate because that is their MO, their whole um, military. I mean, you, you know the playbook, the Israeli military playbook. It is always um, strike back 10 times harder, if not more. Um, it's in, in a disproportionate military operation, which, by the way, is a violation of of. Uh, international law. You are supposed to strike back proportionately um, to how you've been attacked. And this is where Iran really, you know, people are saying, oh, it was a big Iran loss. They got a lot of things shot down. And uh, what did they really, there was no damage. And, and all Israelis went about their, you know, their next day, like as though nothing had happened. But in fact, this is what um, militaries are supposed to do. They are supposed to serve a political outcome and a political agenda. They're not supposed to 
launch wars at every turn. It, the, the story shouldn't be the military, but the story should be the you know, in the political sphere, the negotiation that's taking place, the mediation that's taking place, and how a military operation can help its side achieve its aims, right? Um, so what Iran did was this huge firepower it launched, okay, hundreds and hundreds of projectiles, um, in itself a massive uh, development because Iran, of course, has never struck Israel uh, directly before. And, uh, and then, uh, Iran gave warning, right? It gave plenty of days of warning. I think the strikes happened 12 days after the Israeli strike on the uh, on Iran's uh, consulate in Damascus. So it gave warning. Every single one of Israel's allies who were willing to play in that theater when Iran struck um, were able to set up, you know, their operations, how they would uh, how they would intervene to protect Israel, right? Planes will take off from Cyprus, planes will take off from Jordan, who's in, who's out, like all the logistics of it. So Iran gave them plenty of time and then it launched these uh, hundreds of projectiles knowing that the vast majority were going to be taken down because they'd given their enemy all the notice they could possibly need. At the same time, the Iranian military was able to absolutely strikes, strike the bank of targets that it had decided to strike which were two, from what we understand, two military bases, uh, two Air, Air Force bases in the Negev that were involved in the strikes on Iran's consulate and an Israeli intelligence center in the Golan Heights. Now, the Americans the next day, it's like we hit down 99% of their projectiles, but they missed all the ones that hit targets linked to the Iranian consulate. I mean, this was, it's, it's really astounding. This is a military ballet, you know, so to speak. Now, of course, they're, the Israeli, the Americans are saying, come on, Israel, take this win, don't strike back. There may be mistakes, and then this thing will escalate. Um, but, uh, you know, Israel doesn't know how to um, do a tactical strike that serves its interest. It has to do big and incendiary and, you know, um, Hollywood. Otherwise, it feels like it's fallen short. That's why Western military analysts are completely underestimating the Iranian military genius of the strikes on Saturday and Sunday. You know, they accomplish a goal importantly. So the other part of the story is Israel says, ah, what did you hit? You made a little dent in our in our airfield at the airbase, right? Or, you know, nothing severe. Um, the point was, and I been repeating this on loop, by the way, so you may have heard me say it elsewhere, that these were meant to be tap strikes. Know that we can hit you here, know that we can hit you there, know that we can take your ships in the Strait of Hormoz, you know, which they did hours before the strikes commenced on Saturday night. So um, this, this was a tap operation. We are a um, professional military that serves its political, the, our country's political agenda. We did what we need to. You are on full alert. We didn't harm anyone. We went for military targets. We didn't even harm anyone there. We just need you to understand what we can strike and that you cannot intercept. And we can flood yeah. your skies and all your inter interceptors massively. Israel didn't win anything. It needed three nuclear powers to help it intercept missiles. And it desperately needed Jordan and Arab fig leaf or Muslim fig leaf to participate. I don't know if the Israelis will get that Arab Muslim help the next time around because King Abdullah has been dragged for his participation in the in defense of Israel uh, against a, a Muslim country's legitimate strikes on the state. Yeah, and you know, that's what's so interesting to me about all of this is that what Iran did was they actually exposed several countries in that all of those that rushed in to help to help Israel, right? You had not just the usual suspects like the US, the UK, and France, but also, as you were mentioning, Jordan. I know that there's also some reports about Saudi Arabia that they were involved in shooting down Iranian missiles and drones. Now, 
when it comes to those other countries, like looking at Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and the UAE, does this kind of put the spotlight on them more so? Because previously, yeah, they have played kind of, or at least tried to make it look like they were playing kind of an intermediary role, but now they have really been thrown into the fray of being exposed for just how much they were willing to protect Israel and protect what? These these military sites, right? These were not strikes that were targeting civilians specifically. Of course, the U.S. went to the Saudis and the Emiratis in particular, because the Emirat, the, the, the UAE basically led the Abraham Accords on the Arab side of um, matters. And of course, they went to them to ask them for, for help. Um, more, not so much because they needed their military help and their radars are all American anyways, um, but because they needed the fig leaf of an Arab or Muslim participant, right, to to um, defray the obvious fallout from from this that would anyways happen. Um, the but, but keep in mind, just uh, in the last month, uh, the and more, maybe two three months now. The UAE and Saudis refused to um, allow American bases to operate um, uh, their their Yemen strikes um, out of their country's bases. Okay, let me say that again. The 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 U.S. the the, the Saudis and the Emiratis just a few months ago um, told the Americans, put the Americans on notice that they would not be able to operate strikes against Yemen from U.S. bases in Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And I believe other countries in in the Persian Gulf also did that. Um, The UAE and the Saudis have been fighting an eight, nine year war, I think now with with Yemen, and they have been subject to um, missile strikes in their major cities. They do not want to um, uh, raise the ire of the Yemenis and certainly not for, um, for Israel you know, an American UK agenda that doesn't impact them in any significant way. What what position does that put Saudi Arabia in? They've been kind of going back and forth on this. You know, the US wants normalization. Obviously, Saudi Arabia has said that that is off the table. But for them to provide any protection for Israel, I mean, where does well, that really show where they are? Okay, but the Saudis and the Emiratis are not Jordan. They have, you know, they're they're very wealthy countries, and they're countries, um, moreover, um, that have said no to the U.S. on countless occasions, uh, especially as they've seen the American military unable to intervene on their behalf, protect their cities. I mean, it was the the inability for the U.S. to to um, help Saudi and 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 um, the Emirates. Uh, during the Yemen Yemeni war um, and other tough scenarios has become crystal clear in the region. So these countries, um, the OPEC plus meetings, for instance, where the Saudis, you know, went with the Russians on pricing and, and on supply, they refused to give in to an American demand to raise production. So the price of oil would fall. Um, so we, we are seeing these, the Saudis and the Emiratis act more independently on um, policies that benefit them um, looking out for their own interests more than American interests, um, and they weren't going to get involved in an Iran-Israel fight. It, I mean, it, it would be ridiculous given that the Saudis and Iranians um, uh, launched reconciliation via uh, Chinese brokers uh, just last year. Um, you know, they they would the Saudis would like to keep the temperature down with Iran, and so would the Emiratis, who have. Um, very active economic and trade relations with Iran. Both the Saudis and Emiratis, in addition, have um, reconciled, you know, with with Iran's Syrian ally in the last year or two. Um, so, so they have no, they have no place in an Iran-Israel fight. Um, there are pr- plenty of things that can go wrong in that scenario, and these countries and their leaders have been bleeding um, credibility for the last six months with their populations and Arab populations in general because of their inability and unwillingness to intercede on behalf of Gaza um, and and stop the carnage there. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine when it comes to those 
ongoing tensions. I know that there is a lot going on in the region. Now, when it comes to what Israel may do, right, when it comes to this sort of response that some in the West are calling for that they want to see Israel do, if there is a possibility of Israel targeting Iran directly, could you see this escalating even more? Now that Iran has made it clear, look, we are showing you what we can do. We're communicating with you along the way, but we're also not going to put up with you targeting us directly. Is there concern that that is going to happen? Yeah, because any kind of, you you can't, the problem with operations, the problem with uh, military conflict is you cannot anticipate all the, um, the, the things that could impact it, you know? Uh, so uh, while Iran, <laughs> and Iranians may be concerned, um, it doesn't uh, sort of distract them remotely from the fact that they have chosen this path and will go down this path till the end. It's not an option. Oh God, something happened that we didn't calculate for. Let's bail. That's no longer an option. You know, if the UN Security Council had done the right thing and condemned Israel's bombing of the Iranian um, consulate uh, in, in, in Damascus, none of this would have happened. Iran had to go down this route for obvious re reasons. Um, and it did so in a very responsible way, cleaving to international law. Um, they have, however, said Iran's deputy foreign minister, he said that um, any if, 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 if Israel stri strikes Iran, any response to that strike would not be 12 days later um, but would be within seconds, okay? They have, you know, this operation that Iran conducted over the weekend was called True Promise, and they were true to their promise that they would strike Israel, regardless of the millions of people who said Iran will never strike Israel. They then said, we are done with our operation, okay? And you should end it there too. We retaliated to your offensive action, right? Um, Again, the, the promise then was that we will strike back, not in this way. We will do a full military retaliation, which is not going to be a war, a full-out war, because the Iranian military will target smartly. So in other words, they are likely to respond in kind to what Israel does next, if it does anything. Um, it's important to point out that in the Lebanon Israel military theater that's been going on for um, uh, six months now over the uh, Lebanon southern border, um, Hezbollah has set a new ratio, uh, which is very important. Every important violation, a strike by Israel that violates the existing rules of engagement that these two countries and militaries have tacitly understood to be red lines. Every viol Israeli violation of that is now being met by a Hezbollah counter. So if Israel, when Israel uh, targets, you know, targeted Saleh Aruri for assassination, um, Israel, uh, Hezbollah hit an important Israeli military target. It hit um, an air base, the Meron air base. You know, when, when Israel uh, does something else in Lebanon, stretches into uh, northern, areas like Bikha or more north of the southern border to uh, Saida, for instance, Hezbollah then retaliated with a strike on Israel's, um, the Israeli army's northern command base. So Iran will not necessarily do a, um, you know, target by target, like an exact thing, but they will do something that is extremely, uh, um, you know, it's profit for, for, for the Israelis. So, uh, you know, it's funny to me, I mean, I don't get it. Like, don't American experts and strategists read, or, or Israeli ones for the matter, because what did they do in the aftermath of Iran saying that it would retaliate for the consulate strike? Um, it shut down 28 Israeli embassies around the world. I could have told you that Israel would, Iran would not hit an is Israeli diplomatic mission, A, because Iran is really does cleave to international law and its responses and its actions. It tries to do that. It doesn't have to stick with the IAEA and 
the nuclear intrusion, you know, that they receive, but it does because it believes in international law as ultimately protecting it and its sovereignty and territorial integrity. So it's obvious to me that they wouldn't strike an Israeli mission. Secondly, Israel, Iran would not do this because it would not violate the sovereignty and territorial integrity of a third state. Israeli missions are not in Israel. They're in other countries. These other countries are um, UN member states too. You know, if Iran wants to be treated right, rightly in, 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 at the UN Security Council and within, within the UN General Assembly, it has to respect the, you know. So, but importantly, Iran continues to, as I, have, you know, we've been talking about, boil the frog, um, which, uh, you know, makes makes Israel frantic, makes Israel do frantic, hysterical things, makes Israel do big drama, um, makes Israel hit back um, blindly. Um, in all these actions, Iran is just very calculatingly recalibrating its image as a serious international actor and Israel's image as a pariah state. So there are so many tactics and strategies at place here. Never expect an Iranian response that will fulfill your expectations. They will, it will always surprise you because it just thinks differently. You have to be in that mindset. You can't calculate, you can study it forever, but if you don't fundamentally get it, you know, that they they use the military for sane purposes. They try desperately not to hit civilian targets. They try to cleave to international law, but they need to draw, um, they, they need to establish deterrence with Israel, which is a crazy state acting crazily without any breaks whatsoever from its allies. Um, and that will be the Iranian response in my view. Yeah, and it, it's so interesting to me, the fact that Israel did close all of those embassies because the narrative coming from Israel here is that Iran is the bad guy, right? That Iran would, they're, they're acting as though Iran would do what Israel has been doing. They're acting as though, oh, Iran would target these embassies. And it's like, wait a second, who's doing that? Who's violating other countries' sovereignty? Oh, Israel is doing that. Absolutely. But at the same time, you also have Netanyahu in this position where for months now he's claimed, oh, we're going to go into Gaza. We're going to defeat Hamas. Well, clearly he has not defeated Hamas. And now he's in a situation where he's been promising this ground invasion of Rafa and he's gotten some international pushback. He's doubled down. But then all of a sudden that is being postponed as he's now focusing on Iran. Do you think that Netanyahu is in a place right now where he's looking more towards these tensions with Iran and with Hezbollah as a way to distract from Gaza, to distract from the fact that not only has he not defeated Hamas, but he's not anywhere close to that. And if there is a ground invasion of Rafah, it would be yet another humanitarian catastrophe on top of everything that Israel has put the Palestinians through so far. You know, I always say part of why Israel does not make Make smart decisions anymore um, strategically is because it's a very different Israel 75 years later. The early Zionists who um, colonized and occupied Israel were willing to throw their bodies in harm's way to realize their ideological dream. Um, they took the state's survival, which was a very low likelihood at the time, um, very seriously. Okay. And so they acted, um, of course, they they conducted the Nakba. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm talking about, um, you know, uh, doing what was an interest in the interest of the state, no matter what. Um, today, you have an Israeli cabinet full of political competitors who are all looking to one up each other and um, and, and and be popular. OK, and win elections. That's it's kind of it kind of reflects what happens what's happening in the U.S. today. Um, politicians, presidents, you know, um, secretaries of different U.S. departments are um, you know positioning themselves uh, for cameras, you know, and for quotes and for praise um, rather than for what's in the U.S.'s best interest. Um, so Netanyahu is just another 
um, a, another part of the problem. I don't appreciate the fixation on Netanyahu as the problem. Netanyahu is just one of now millions of Zionist, nationalist, right-wing ideologues. Um, you know, the other Israeli cabinet members uh, get a free ride off of people like Smotrich and, and um, Ben Gavir, who were considered the crazies by their Western allies. Um, they shouldn't be given a free, free ride. They're just as crazy. They're just as awful. Uh, they're just as Zionist and ideological and right wing. Um, and they're just as um, hell bent on um, occupying more West Bank land, taking over Palestinian homes in East Jerusalem, um, about acting uh, disproportionately in uh, militarily in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria, in the West Bank. Um, and elsewhere. So um, nothing will change much. I mean, right now, Netanyahu is the fall guy, right? Because the Gaza war has been so badly executed, reaching none of its aims. But, you know, put anyone else in there and everything will continue. And then what? The next guy is going to be the fall guy. This is why Israel's had three elections in as many years, because there's nobody at the top with a vision anymore. That, that sufficiently detracts from Israel's, you know, um, uh, trajectory of decline, okay, and combustion. You need a visionary to pull you out of that hole. And there are none left in Israel who have made it to, you know, the top slots. So Netanyahu is just another one. Get rid of him. The next guy will make a series of mistakes because Israel doesn't know how to get off its trajectory. Um, and the Israeli military, um, interestingly enough, I mean, we did a piece a while ago on this. I don't know if the balance and views have changed, but Netanyahu was not so gung-ho in this analysis we did on a um, starting a full-fledged Lebanon war, but several of his military commanders were pushing a um, major confrontation on the Lebanon front. So if, if uh, as Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, said uh, just a few weeks ago, if you can't win in Gaza, you're going to come for Lebanon? Seriously? <laughs> um, and that may be, by the way, today there's a, there's a commentary. I don't remember um, which publication I saw it in. It might have been, um, I'm trying to think if it was a Western publication or not, but it was basically about how um, you had, uh, hold on, let me see if I can find it. Um, here we go. Basically how there's, there's discussions about, um, maybe, uh, Israel's, Israel's, um, reaction to Iran. Uh, um, here it is. Oh, okay. It's our report, but we're quoting someone else. Um, Israel's, uh, response to Iran may be to target, um, strongly one of Iran's allies in the region, um, likely possibly to be Hezbollah, because obviously they've done everything they can with uh, against Hamas. So that may be, um, oh, sorry, Hezbollah in Syria. So, you know, I was thinking that's got to be wrong because they're scared of Hezbollah. But Hezbollah in Syria, Syria has become low-hanging fruit for Israel. It can't, like, do its, like, strikes on Gaza you know, it used to do a mowing the lawn strategy every few months or six months every year to mow the lawn in Gaza. Syria became that that target for Israel for a few years um, where it's launched thousands of strikes on the country because the country, you know, is struggling to recover from the war. Huge sanctions imposed on it, American sanctions that have shut down its economy. It's in dire situation. And Israel knows that the Syrian army is likely not going to straight back in any significant way. So Syria is now low-hanging fruit to hit Hezbollah in Syria. Notice they didn't say hit the IRGC in Syria, as they did on April 1st. They're talking about hitting Hezbollah in Syria, hoping that um, Hezbollah will not have the dramatic military response that Iran showed us on over the weekend. Um, it also shows that maybe they're not so willing to hit IRGC targets in Syria anymore because, um, uh, and I don't know uh, if this was an official 
uh, Iranian statement, but it was made by an Iranian, it was comments made by an Iranian official that you can't, uh, this is not just about hitting our soil, right, the consulate, but um, hitting our top military officials. So if Iran draws a red line on the military officials, Israel's assassination strategy has to be reworked very quickly. Um, it's what it's been, it's what it's, it's been doing that for years and Iran has turned the other cheek and personally myself in, in conversations with a sort of a, a resistance access officials in this region, I've often said, you know, y'all have been quite strong in establishing uh, deterrence in various ways, okay, um, militarily, right? Uh, but not in this assassination strategy, Israel's assassination strategy. You, like, why aren't you doing that? And not elsewhere in a foreign country, you know, the meat will be to hit Israeli officials inside Israel proper, you know, that's when they'll stop. So I really don't know why that doesn't happen. I mean, some people have suggested it's very, very difficult for Iran to do, but I, 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 we see Iran doing all kinds of things inside Israel that doesn't come to the media's attention. You know, um, would this be that hard? I don't know. So, you know, we'll see, but I think that's the range of Iran's, uh, uh, reactions, and we're just going to have to wait and see because this axis likes surprises. It really likes its surprises, you know, <laughs> which is why the Americans game these scenarios so much, the U.S. Pentagon, because, and they, they don't just do it with their people. They invite outsiders like Arab journalists, um, you know, uh, think tank or tankies to sit in these gaming scenarios because they need out of the box thinking things they may not have calculated. Um, but they're still, you know, um, hitting their head against a wall. You know, Iran surprised everybody on Saturday and people can, you know, trash the response as much as they want. But real military experts know what Iran does or, or did and I think are quite stunned by it. So let's see what the next play is. Yeah, I know that there is certainly a lot at stake here all around and a lot to continue to keep an eye on. And I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today to break down the latest here. Sharmin Narwani, a journalist and the editor in chief of The Cradle. Thank you so much for your time and insight today. Thank you, Rachel. It is always such a pleasure to speak with you. If anything in this video resonated with you, be sure to like it, share it with your friends, leave a comment, and as always, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to keep up with all of my work, make sure that you're subscribed to my page on Substack. That's rachelblevins.substack.com. If you want to support my work, you can also check out my page on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash rachelblevins. That's where you can sign up as a monthly paid subscriber and join the community there. As always, thank you all so much for all of your support, and I'll see you next time time.